So hi everyone, my name is Julia Mayetta and we are so pleased that you could join us this week for our lecture in volume three of our No Neuropsychology Didactic series that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. And we would like to thank our sponsors for their support of the series. Before we start, here are the disclaimers. Uh, this training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions today can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left corner of your screen, and a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website later this week. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Buckholtz for today's lecture on non-epileptic seizures and other functional neurological disorders. Dr. Buckholtz is a clinical neuropsychologist and instructor in the Division of Medical Psychology of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She is a Baltimore native who received her undergraduate degree in clinical psychology from Lehigh University in 2007, and she earned a master's degree in clinical psychology from Towson University in 2012. Later, she obtained her doctoral degree in clinical psychology from uh, Rosalind Franklin University of Medicine and Science. Following a one-year neuropsychology internship at Rush University Medical Center, Dr. Buckholz completed a three-year postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology with the Division of Medical Psychology at Johns Hopkins. She joined the Johns Hopkins Medical Psychology faculty in 2020, um, and her primary professional interest is in the neuropsychology of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, PNES, and other functional neurological disorders, or FND. Dr. Buckholz is also a founding member of the uh, Functional Neurological Disorder Society. So we are certainly pleased to have her here for today's lecture. So I'll turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Julia. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you to everyone who is attending today. Let me go ahead and get my screen shared. Okay. Um, so like Julia said, I'm gonna be talking to you all today about the evaluation and treatment of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, which I'll refer to as PNES, and other functional neurological disorders or FNDs. Um, so to get started, oh, one moment here, I'm frozen. Okay, I'm not sure why, but I'm not able to advance through my PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> give me just a moment here to try to get this figured out. Do you wanna maybe stop sharing and share again? Sometime? Yeah, let me do that. Let me do that, that's a good idea. Okay. Let's do that. Dr. Buckholz, if you need, you can also email me your presentation and I can share it if we're having technical problems. Okay, let me just, I just closed out a bunch of okay. hopefully unnecessary things that I had open. <laughs> no problem. And then let's see if this works. I think this is going to work. Just give me one 
Hi, can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay. Now we're now we're in business. Um, okay, so um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, and basically the layout of, of how I'd like to talk to you all about these um, these concepts today is to first define them, what really are functional neurological disorders, um, discuss the prevalence and implications of these, you know, wh why do we really even care about functional neurological disorders? What, what do they mean? What's the impact? Um, discuss some different types, the phenomenology, sort of what the presentation is, what we're looking for, um, and then more specifically the diagnosis and actual evaluation or evaluations of FNDs, um, including PNES. Um, and then the treatment, um, you know, what, what can we do to help people who have functional neurological disorders? And then I'll talk a little bit about the development of um, a functional neurological disorder program at Johns Hopkins that I'm, I'm working on um, with, with many colleagues. It's a multidisciplinary effort to say the least. Um, and just what that looks like sort of for us and what that looks like sort of more broadly. So in terms of the definition of, of a functional neurologic, neurological disorder, what this really is, is a problem with the functioning of the nervous system um, and how the brain and the body are communicating essentially rather than a structural disease. So people might've heard of the idea of this being more of a software than a hardware problem is how it's often referred to. There's been a longstanding history of a, a dualism between sort of mind and body when it comes to um, understanding these. And so there's been some contention between psychiatry and neurology in terms of where do these belong? Um, you know, for a very long time, we thought of these symptoms as, as being purely conversion symptoms and a purely psychiatric or psychological problem. Um, and so, you know, it, it remains a, a psychiatric diagnosis, but we have come largely through the use of functional MRI to have a better understanding of the neurobiological and pathophysiological um, bases of, of FND and sort of what that looks like in the brain. And that's really challenged a lot of people's um, assumptions or opinions that have been really longstanding about this being a purely psychiatric or psychological process or conversion disorder, if you will, um, or psychogenic illness. So one of the um, studies that I'll highlight here, this is an example of findings from some work by Dr. Corinne Maurer and colleagues from 2016. And you'll see that the figure on the left is showing group differences in right temporoparietal junction resting state functional connectivity between patients with functional movement disorders and healthy controls. Um, and then you can also see that they're showing in panel A, um, bilateral supplementary motor area, which is circled there. And then in panel B, the right precentral gyrus, and in panel C, the right postcentral gyrus, and then in D, the right insulin E, the cerebellar vermis. Um, and then you can see over on the other figure on the right, that's a connectivity map, which shows in panel A um, findings showing the, that um, right temporoparietal junction functional connectivity in patients with functional motor uh, disorders or movement disorders compared to healthy controls, showing that there's an increased level of childhood emotional abuse. So basically what they're showing here is that there, there are changes or differences in the connectivity in the brain, and those can be related to psychological or psychiatric um, factors such as childhood emotional abuse. And in general, um, the findings from a lot of the fMRI literature basically show similar findings to these, that there's a sort of disconnection in people with functional neurological disorders or in the brains of people with functional neurological disorders between cortical regions of, of agency, like the temporoparietal occipital region, um, the multimodal integration areas like precuneal and posterior cingulate, supplementary motory cortices and executive regions, and also motor regions like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, and limbic regions that are sort of regulating emotion. So you can see how the combination of those things could really um, result in the production of a functional neurological disorder. So 
again, point being that with the use of advanced technologies, advanced neuroimaging, we're coming to understand these more on that sort of neurobiological pathophysiological basis, which of course complicates the notion um, of this being, you know, purely psychiatric or psychological disorder and a conversion disorder. Um, but also I think obviously can, can help us better understand what's really going on here um, and, and properly treat patients. So again, like I said, Despite all of that, as of now, uh, functional neurological symptom disorder, func functional neurological disorder, um, remains synonymous with a conversion disorder, really, you know, per the diagnostic criteria, per the DSM. Um, the DSM-5 did uh, include the functional neurological symptom disorder part because of the fact that, you know, we're now, we're now better able to understand these from more of a, like I said, a, a, a neuropathological um, or pathophysiological basis. And that, that helps provide, like I was saying, sort of a causative neutrality um, and can also help increase patient understanding and acceptance of the disorder. Um, obviously, we've, you know, we've retained the term uh, conversion disorder, um, but what you can do now when you're diagnosing these is you can specify whether or not it's with a psychological stressor or not, or an identifiable psychological stressor or not, which can be helpful. Um, one thing I'll point out here among the criteria, obviously you have to have these symptoms of altered vol uh, voluntary motor or sensory function. Um, I'm sorry, that should say involuntary uh, motor or sensory function. Um, and then the, the second two criteria that, that are very important to have both is that the clinical findings not only provide evidence um, between the incompatibility between the symptom and, and recognizable conditions, but that they can't be better explained by another condition. So it's, it's not just that they can't be explained by another condition, but that there need to be findings that show that that's really not compatible. And what that, what that sort of means, um, or what that's implicating sort of is positive signs or positive findings on exams. And that's what's really important about um, the neurological that, uh, exam that, that has to be done in, in order to properly diagnose a functional neurological disorder, um, because without that, we really can't be certain. And there are many positive signs that neurologists look for, and that's important. I think, you know, in the past, this was thought of as more of a, a, a disorder or diagnosis of, of exclusion. Um, and, you know, sort of the criteria number three, you know, that it just couldn't be explained by something else. Um, but now what we know is that Criterion two is actually very important. Again, that there's there are signs of incompatibility or positive signs. Um, so I think that's an important important point. Um, in terms of the prevalence, I think this is very surprising to to a lot of people. Maybe not surprising to some, but these are extremely common. They're the second most common um, behind headache referral, new referral to uh, neurology clinics. So they're incredibly common and more common than a lot of, you know, a lot of other neurological disorders or conditions. Um, and 30% of patients in neurology clinics in general, not just new referrals, have symptoms um, that, you know, can't really be explained by another disease. And a little over 5% of, of patients in neurology clinics have actually been diagnosed with FND. So these are very common, they're very, very common. Um, in terms of some specific subtypes of FND, so PNES, for example, approximately one third of the beds in epilepsy monitoring units are occupied at a given time by patients with PNES. So that's a lot. Um, and they account for probably about 20% of the patients, about a fifth of the patients uh, who were referred to epilep epilepsy centers in general. Um, another subgroup of, of patients with functional neurological disorders, something called triple PD, persistent postural perceptual dizziness. Um, that's a sensory functional neurological disorder. Some of my colleagues in vestibular neurology at Johns Hopkins have said that about 80 to 90% of the patients that are coming into their clinic these days are getting diagnosed with triple PD. So that's really an astonishingly high number. Um, and then in terms of co-occurrence of, or comorbidity of, of 
functional neurological disorders and um, other neurological disorders. For example, in, in patients with seizures, it depends what literature you read and what study you look at, but it's, it's fair to say that probably about 10% of patients have concurrent PNES and epileptic seizures. So there is, there is a, a large um, or, you know, important um, degree of, of overlap. So it's not uncommon for someone to have both a neurological, neurogenic um, disorder, and then also have a, 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 a quote unquote psychogenic or functional um, disorder as well. So because of the fact that there are so many people with functional neurological disorders, um, the US is spending about over a billion dollars, $1.2 billion and increasing per year um, on the evaluation and treatment of functional neurological disorders. And you know, probably more importantly, um, people with functional neurological disorders are experiencing greater distress, disability and disability related um, financial dependence than patients with symptoms of explained disease. Um, these two studies, one, the, the first one on, pan, on the left um, speaks to the, the latter about the disability and distress experienced by patients with functional neurological disorders. Um, and um, the, the study on the right talks about sort of the costs and the, the annual costs, like I said, are tremendous and they're similar to other neurological disorders um, and they're increasing. Um, and they're increasing at a higher rate than those associated with other neurological disorders. Um, you know, it, in a given year in the US, there's 40,000 functional neurological disorder emergency department visits, 20,000 admissions. Um, the, the study that um, I, I show there talks about how there's a shorter length of stay in the hospital for folks with functional neurological disorders but higher workup rates compared to people who are ultimately diagnosed with neurological disorders. Um, and that's really, that's really important. That's something I'll speak to later. Um, and despite that, despite the fact that they have higher workups, they actually had pretty low rates of inpatient therapies, of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and psychiatric consultation. So they're there, they're getting lots of workups, but they're not necessarily getting the workups or the interventions that they need while they're there. Um, and so the point really being that there's unnecessary investigations taking place. There's a lot of iatrogenic harm um, that's going on for these patients. Um, and this all really inflates the cost. Um, and this is all also at the expense of patients not receiving the necessary psychiatric and rehabilitative treatments. Um, so, so the current state of affairs is not good. Um, needless to say. So in talking about the different types of functional neurological disorders, I know I've mentioned a few things so far, um, they can basically be broken down into sort of five subtypes, motor, sensory, axial, speech, and paroxysmal. So that's like PNES, it's the psychogenic seizures. Um, an example of a motor functional neurological disorder would be something like uh, tremor. Um, a sensory example would be something like that triple PD that I was referring to, which is basically just constant dizziness um, that can't be explained by, by some other sort of neurovestibular cause. Um, and there's other, there, there are other uh, criteria for that, but that's the, the general gist is it's sort of constant dizziness. Um, axial or like gait disorders. Um, so, you know, impaired gait um, and walking. Speech can be something like stuttering or a foreign accent. Um, and then, like I said, the paroxysmal is, is like the psychogenic seizures. Um, so in terms of symptoms or, or signs, I should say, that are, that are associated with these different functional neurological disorders, um, there are many. And this is really important because, again, I think, you know, historically, people thought of this as a diagnosis of exclusion. It was you know, some people thought that, oh, well, if, you know, just can't be explained by something else, then it must be functional or must be psychogenic. Um, but what I've come to appreciate and learn more and more about every day from my neurology colleagues um, are all these functional, these uh, positive signs and how important it is to do a really thorough 
work up for these. And, and to that point, I think this is where um, it becomes really important that, that patients have had, um, you know, we don't want to over evaluate and have patients go through unnecessary evaluations and medical interventions. Um, but it is certainly important that they're properly evaluated by an expert. So if it's someone who's having suspected psychogenic seizures, that they have a proper evaluation um, for that by an epilepsy neurologist, or if it's someone who's having, you know, motor symptoms, that they're seen by a movement disorders neurologist who can really um, distinguish between things that are neurogenic and things that are psychogenic. Um, so there's obviously a, a large list of, of different positive signs here, but a few that I'll point out, um, functional weakness um, is basically recognized by variability and severity over time. Um, and it can be discordant between assessments, even during the same examination, for example. So that's something that you'll frequently see. Neurologists notice is that they, they observe what they think is functional weakness. And again, that means that it's really kind of varying in severity over time. Um, and it's, it's inconsistent between assessments or during the same assessment. Um, another sign is the whack-a-mole sign, which is when if, if someone has a motor functional neurological disorder, like a tremor or something like that, when the initially affected body part is held down, the tremor um, or whatever the other motor symptom is will emerge or worsen in another body part. So again, whack-a-mole, you kind of hold it down and it pops up somewhere else. Um, Entrainment is something that's commonly referred to if you're, you know, reviewing records, for example, of someone who might have a functional neurological disorder. And basically what that means is that if you have somebody do something, again, if you're looking at, you know, a, a functional tremor, for example, and you have the person tap with, with their unaffected hand, um, the affected hand, the one that had the tremor, um, will kind of pause or maybe even take on the same frequency as the, uh, the hand that starts tapping. Um, so that's what entrainment is referring to, if you see that. Um, so again, those are just a few examples, but there's obviously a, a lot that neurologists are looking for. And again, it's very important because I think particularly for patients too, when you're disclosing the diagnosis, um, you know, patients wanna know, you know, are, they're not just diagnosing me with this because it doesn't match anything else, but you know, is there really a way to know that this is what it is? And so this can often be um, when I'm disclosing di you know, diagnosis or not necessarily being the one to dis disclose the initial diagnosis myself, but when I'm talking to the patient about their diagnosis, um, this is something that I often refer to and kind of reiterate for them to understand. Because um, sometimes it's not something that's been explained um, to them yet by any of the, the, the folks that they've seen prior to coming to me. Um, Here's just a little, uh, some, some pictures of some other um, positive signs. Um, so the Hoover sign, so that's when, if a weak, a weak hip extension is corrected, when the patient flexes the contralateral, contralateral hip against resistance, um, drift pronation or drift without pronation, um, excuse me, is when the unaffected um, or the affected outstretched arm um, is held supine at the outset and fails to pronate when drifting, um, fixed dystonia, um, expressed as fixed posturing of the jaw um, or the hand, and then tubular vision is a positive sign when the area of the visual field defect remains unchanged despite moving away from the visual target. So here, these are some other common sort of positive signs that neurologists are evaluate for. Um, specifically in, in psychogenic non epileptic seizures, there's been obviously a, a, a lot of research done trying to distinguish signs of psychogenic seizures versus signs of epileptic seizures, um, and then also signs that could be present in both. Um, and so you'll see in, in column, in the third column, that there is overlap. Um, you know, there are a number of yeses. So fluttering, for example, of the eyes could be seen in both. Self-injury could be seen in both. Urinary incontinence could be seen in both. Report of tongue biting um, and nocturnal seizures. And those are actually, I think, pretty important to, to point out just because um, I think a lot of people think of you know, urinary incontinence and tongue biting as being something that's specific to epileptic seizures. And that's definitely not the case. That's certainly not the case. 
Um, but there are other things that are that are more specific to epileptic or psychogenic seizures. Um, and for example, with, with one of the sort of major things that that's often looked at is the duration. So something last or lasting longer than three minutes probably is not an epileptic event. Um, having memory of the event, that's an indication that it's a psychogenic episode or a non-epileptic episode. Um, pelvic thrusting, side to side head movements, thrashing, sort of a fluctuating course, um, being able to, the, the bystanders or you know the, the doctors who are in the room or family who are in the room being able to modulate symptoms, um, awareness during the, the seizure itself, um, those are all signs or indicators that it's it's more likely a psychogenic or functional episode. Um, so importantly, there really is a gold standard for diagnosing psychogenic seizures. Um, and basically what that is, is the, the use of video EEG. So video monitoring um, with ongoing EEG. And so this goes on in epilepsy monitoring units. Um, and, you know, the, the hope is that while well, somebody's admitted, usually for a few days to a week, that they will have one of their typical events um, and that we'll be able to capture on EEG whether or not there's um, epileptic activity. Um, and that's that's kind of the hope when someone's admitted to an epilepsy monitoring unit, of course, is to try to capture a typical event and understand what's going on in terms of the electrical activity in the brain. So for psychogenic seizures, what we're looking for is the clinical event in the absence of any sort of abnormal electrical activity. Um, and if that happens, we can be quite confident, probably about 90% confident that, that that is what's going on. Um, however, there are some complications because um, things like frontal lobe epilepsy, for example, might only be measurable in 10 to 20% of cases. So it is possible that somebody could have a clinical seizure and there might not be activity on the EEG and, um, you know, that that could be mistakenly diagnosed as a non-epileptic event and actually be a frontal lobe event. Um, so the diagnosis of PNES really is never is never definitive in that sense, because that's always a remote possibility. Um, and another note is that really, to, to, if you think about it conceptually, you know, if someone's being admitted to a video uh, to video monitoring or video EEG in the EMU, the epilepsy monitoring unit, um, they should be having at least weekly seizures because otherwise it's quite possible that you just missed it, right? If they're only there for a few days um, or a week at a time. Um, however, with all that said, um, there has been a, a lot of research also done on sort of the accuracy of these diagnoses. And um, what, what's sort of emerged is, is the finding that only about 4% of people who are diagnosed with functional neurological disorders go on to be diagnosed with something else, with something neurogenic. So um, the, the moral of the story being that the current um, evaluative and, and diagnostic procedures are actually quite good. In terms of diagnosing um, functional movement disorders or motor disorders, the, the the criteria here um, are not quite as strong. Um, there's poorer iterator reliability uh, when, when applied to uncertain movement disorders. So um, again, you know, despite that, there's only about 4% that are misdiagnosed, but you can be more confident in a diagnosis of, if, if they've undergone proper evaluation, you can be more confident probably in a diagnosis of psychogenic non epileptic seizures than in a diagnosis of a functional movement disorder. Um, and, and I see that, you know, clinically, that it, it actually seems more common for people to be reevaluated for, for functional movement disorders or for, or for um, neurologists who diagnose a functional movement disorder to be not quite as confident in the initial diagnosis and maybe more open to the idea of the patient getting a second opinion um, then in psychogenic non-epileptic seizures where once it's established, it seems to be um, sort of the consensus and, and everyone feels comfortable moving forward with treatment for that. So 
in terms of other things that we look for, obviously there are the, the, um, the signs during the neurological evaluations, um, but then there's other things that, that we look for. And this is, I think, where neuropsychologists can be particularly helpful when evaluating and potentially treating patients with functional neurological disorders. Um, in terms of sort of predisposing and precipitating and perpetuating factors, um, psychological stressors, again, that's not necessarily always there. Um, importantly, um, you know, it, that's, that's something that we've come to appreciate, but it can be, um, and it can be a sign that, you know, the, the symptoms may have emerged from that. Um, so these are things that, that, you know, we can be really helpful with, um, with looking into employed in, in a health profession. Um, that's another common characteristic. Um, in, in, in patients that have um, functional neurological disorders. Um, multiple somatization or undiagnosed conditions is another one. Um, so there's other things that we, we can help look for and inform um, that aren't necessarily evaluated for in a neurological evaluation. Um, how suggestible the symptoms might be, although oftentimes neurologists do look for that. Um, Here's some more, and, and I do see a, a lot of this and a lot of overlap um, there. You know, like I said, there's certainly not the case that every person who has a functional neurological disorder has a history of trauma or has a clear psychological stressor um, precipitating the onset of their symptoms. Um, some studies have actually shown that there's only, trauma is only present in about a third of patients with functional neurological disorders, so not, not all. Um, but it's more common. It's more common in patients with functional neurological disorders than in other disorders. Um, and, and it is, you know, when you see these patients clinically for long enough, you, you, you notice that, um, that more of your patients with functional neurological disorders have histories of trauma than, than other populations you might work with. Um, another really common one is a history of panic symptoms or panic attacks, um, history of alexithymia, often associated to the, the trauma. Um, dissociative episodes. Um, it's very frequent also to see patients with other potentially functional symptoms like functional gastrointestinal symptoms, for example. Um, patients with, um, have a history of headache, um, migraine. Um, listed here under somatic symptoms are some of the things that I just mentioned. Um, reinforcement um, by others um, of the symptoms that can that can definitely be sort of a perpetuating factor. Illness exposure is, is a very interesting one. Um, I find that frequently a lot of the patients that I see with functional neurological disorders do have a family history uh, or their spouse or loved one has a history of a neurological disorder with similar symptoms. So either epilepsy um, or Parkinson's disease or something like that, or has had a stroke or traumatic brain injury that's resulted in similar symptoms. Again, like I said, profession in a, a medical field is, is pretty common. Um, so these are all things that I look for when I'm evaluating these patients. And again, if they're not necessarily diagnostic, you know, just because this, this someone has one or several of these characteristics, um, that doesn't mean that they're going to have a functional neurological disorder, but um, they're common. And um, I think worth, worth sort of noting when you're evaluating a patient. Um, these are factors that have been listed as specific um, associated factors in PNES, so similar um, to the, the list that I just showed you, which was, which was um, more general to functional neurological disorders. Um, gender is an, an interesting one. So um, that, um, you know, historically, the literature has shown that these are more common um, in women. Um, but there was um, a study that was done more recently that showed that um, functional motor symptoms or movement sim symptoms that mimic Parkinson's uh, disease was actually more common in men. So, you know, it might be the case that PNAS is more common in women, but um, we're learning more about how there might be differences um, between functional neurological disorders um, and sex differences in different subtypes. Um, most of these things I've already spoken to. Um, age, these are most common in young adults. So people in their you know, 20s and 30s 
And that can also be helpful, for example, in psychogenic seizures in terms of um, something to consider when diagnosing is that we know that epileptic seizures are most often um, occurring um, for the first time when people are you know, young, below age five, or now, you know, more recently, come to appreciate how, how common the onset is in the elderly, whereas this is, uh, this is the opposite. This is sort of in the young adulthood is when um, psychogenic seizures emerge. Um, organicity, uh, what they're referring to there is that uh, there have been neuropsychological deficits um, have been found in patients with um, psychogenic seizures. And one of those things, one of the differences is a lower IQ. Um, and so that's that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, you know, with that said, some of the patients that I, I have seen with psychogenic seizures do have, um, you know, lower IQ, but there's certainly patients that I see with very high intellectual functioning with psychogenic seizures um, as well. Um, the way that patients perform on on tests of performance validity, um, they're they're higher in patients with with psychogenic seizures. Um, about you know twenty eight percent one study showed compared to about eight percent of, of people with epilepsy and, and other general medical conditions. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind, and that's something that I I do see frequently um, during my evaluations is that that patients with functional neurological disorders. Um, are, perf are performing worse on tests of performance validity. Um, the most common finding across studies of, of, of cognitive functioning in patients with functional neurological disorders, though, is slowed processing um, or, or poor performance, I should say, on, on tests of processing speed um, is the most consistent finding. So um, that brings me to my neuropsychological evaluation for functional neurological disorders and sort of what that looks like and what I kind of think a, a neuropsychological evaluation for functional neurological disorders should include. Um, the first thing, of course, is ensuring that the diagnosis has been properly established. So I talked about that a little bit before. And um, again, you know, one of the goals, I think, of, of, of creating a appropriate center for the, the evaluation and treatment of, of functional neurological disorders is to eliminate all of those unnecessary evaluations and interventions that are, you know, not only not helpful for patients, but can cause iatrogenic harm. Um, but at the same time, you do want to make sure that the diagnosis is legitimate, because of course, if it's not, and something has been missed, that can be very dangerous too. Um, so again, usually, you know, I think what that really means is that if there's suspicion of something like this, patients should be sent to a specialist as soon as possible. So to an epilepsy monitoring unit um, or to, you know, a neurologist who specializes in movement disorders, um, as opposed to sent, you know, to general practitioner after general practitioner or even general neurologist after general neurologist, um, so that the diagnosis can be properly established as soon as possible, because that's actually a, a strong prognostic indicator um, how long someone has suffered from their functional symptoms without treatment. So we know that people who are diagnosed earlier on um, have, a, have a better prognosis of responding well to treatment. So that's really important to do that as soon as possible. Um, and so that's something that I always make sure has been done. And if I have any doubts about the, um, about the diagnosis or, um, you know, even if I think that, you know, there, like I said, there's oftentimes people have a neurological problem or neurogenic problem and a functional problem. And so if I think that something has been missed, um, I make sure to refer to the appropriate specialist, usually again, either an epilepsy or movement disorders neurologist or neurovestibular um, specialist to make sure that, that everything, um, that all diagnoses are accurate. Um, and then in terms of my evaluation, it really depends on the problem. So some patients are referred to me um, and it's clear that there's also concern for, you know, a comorbid organic brain disease. Um, and then that evaluation look, ends up looking more like a typical neuropsychological evaluation, including, you know, more comprehensive cognitive testing. Um, then sort of the intermediate is if there's, if there's already, if there's a known or suspected intellectual or cognitive disorder or even subjective cognitive difficulties, because that's very common 
um, in this population. And that's actually been getting more attention recently, the idea of a functional cognitive disorder. Um, so if that's there, um, I definitely include measures of, of intellectual and cognitive functioning, but only enough that that's really, um, that really informs whether or not a person can engage in a benefit from treatment. So I'll do something like a test of, of pre-morbid estimated intellect, um, if that's appropriate, you know, if the person doesn't have a, a history of, a, of, you know, reading disorder or something like that, just to get a sense of what their intellectual functioning is. Um, and then, because, you know, the treatment that I'll talk about shortly is, is cognitive behavioral therapy. And there's a lot of very abstract concepts, um, and it's not necessarily an appropriate treatment for folks who are of you know lower than low average um, intellect and, and and you know and when I say an appropriate treatment I mean it you know you need to modify it and adapt it appropriately per patient um, you know so that maybe your interventions are more behavioral as opposed to cognitive for example um, and then you know I'll do tests of of learning and memory just to make sure that someone can learn and remember information from session to session so I'll do something like a wordless learning test or a visuospatial and, and a um, visuospatial um, learning and memory test. And again, that's, I'm just trying to cover the basics just to make sure, you know, can this person engage in the treatment and can they benefit from session to session are the questions I'm really trying to answer there. Um, always, always do a, a comprehensive psychosocial and psychiatric evaluation, of course. Um, the first part is really to, to inform those predisposing and pre precipitating and perpetuating factors um, that I was talking about. And then also to better understand, you know, what if other psychiatric diagnoses does this person have that might require attention either in my treatment um, or in treatment with someone else? Um, so that would be the, the presence of an additional, um, for example, somatic symptom disorder. So sometimes when folks come in with functional neurological symptoms, um, it becomes clear in my evaluation that they also meet criteria for a somatic symptom disorder because, you know, not all do. Some people have functional symptoms and they're not very bothered by them um, and they haven't caused, you know, a lot of preoccupation or stress in their life. And then others is quite the, quite the opposite. And that's important to know in terms of how I approach treatment with them. Um, and then there's, of course, many patients, there's like a huge overlap with other psychiatric disorders. Um, like I say, the most common um, really are adjustment disorders, which often happen after the onset of the functional symptoms, um, history of major depression, um, panic attacks, like I mentioned before, um, anxiety, and, you know, personality, if not rank personality disorders, then at least trait vulnerabilities. Um, and then the final thing that I, that I do is once I establish, you know, whether or not a person can engage in and benefit from treatment, um, and, you know, what diagnoses they might have, um, and, you know, what sort of characteristics or risk factors they have that might speak to their prognosis. Like I mentioned, there are things like the duration of the illness, the presence of other psychiatric issues, the presence of personality trait vulnerabilities, the presence of other health issues um, that are either good or bad prognostic indicators. Um, once I've spoken to all of that, I'll speak to what I think the best treatment is going to be. Um, and so, um, you know, the first, the first step in that really is disclosing the diagnosis. That's the first step in treatment. And oftentimes that happens before the patient even comes um, to, to me. Um, and so that's another, I think, important part of an initiative when, when developing a center for the evaluation of treatment of functional neurological disorders is making sure that the other providers who might see the patient first, usually neurologists, um, know how to do that properly because it, it can be done well and it can be done poorly. And studies have shown that even just the, the initial disclosure of the diagnosis itself can actually have um, a therapeutic effect. And so again, it's, it's really important that that's done appropriately and take advantage of that initial um, intervention opportunity. Um, and that in and of itself, what we know from the literature is that it can help with primary symptoms, but not likely secondary symptoms or in the long term. So, you know, the patient might initially have less seizures, for example, but, you know, they're not going to necessarily experience improvements in quality of life or functionality, and they're likely to experience recurrence of seizures um, later on at a higher rate than they would if they continued to receive treatment. 
Um, the next step of treatment is, is avoiding additional unnecessary workups or interventions or pharmacotherapy. So I'll speak to that as well. I'll say, you know, the, you know, providers should be cautious about, you know, continuing to order additional studies. Um, and that's particularly true for patients who, who also um, have a diagnosis of a somatic symptom disorder, because um, that can really, that can be really be, that can really perpetuate um, that problem. Um, and then pharmacotherapies as well. If it seems like somebody's on a lot of medications that are causing them harm or, or um, you know, preventing them from, from becoming well, um, that's something that I'll, I'll recommend their, um, their providers address. And that's part of what's great about the development of a multidisciplinary center like this is instead of just typing that into your report and sending it off and hoping somebody follows up, you work as a team to really talk about these issues um, with the neuropsychiatrist or the neurologist who might be prescribing medications. Um, then you actually can start your psychological intervention, which is what I, I do um, with many of these patients, which again is a cognitive behavioral based therapy, um, but it really needs to be tailored to the patient. Like I said, based on things like their intellectual functioning and their cognitive functioning, um, but also psychosocial issues. Um, and, you know, personality traits um, and, you know, their, their, their type of communication, their communication style, their interpersonal style. Um, so it really does need to be patient specific. And what we know from the, the studies that have been done um, of psychological interventions, mostly CBT, is that if patients come to at least half to three quarters of their sessions, um, they will experience a, a 55 to 85% reduction in their symptoms. So these are, interventions are really powerful. Um, and then the sort of gold standard treatment is to do cognitive behavioral therapy in conjunction with PT and OT. And that's particularly important for the um, for functional movement disorders, for example, and, um, and other sensory uh, functional disorders like that triple PD, um, the, the, the physical therapy for that or the involves desensitization basically to the vestibular symptoms. Um, and then for the, the movement disorders, the functional movement disorders, it's kind of motor retraining that goes on in the PT and the OT. And that's another great thing about having a multidisciplinary center um, is that we, we work together with PTs and OTs who have experience and expertise um, in working with these patients. So it really is a sort of collaborative effort and everyone can be on the same page. Um, I'm aware of the time here, so I'm gonna go through the next few slides kind of quickly. Um, this is just a, a table of some of the randomized clinical trials that have been done of therapeutic interventions um, for functional neurological disorders, basically showing what I said, that you know, if patients come to a half to three quarter of the sessions, um, they're gonna experience a, a real appreciable benefit. Um, one of these studies, You'll see here, 2014 was done by Kurt LaFrance and colleagues, um, and, and he basically compared CBT and then CBT with Zoloft um, and treatment as usual and found that the, the CBT performed just as well as the CBT with Zoloft and better than the treatment as usual. Um, and so this is the sort of framework that I was first trained in to treat patients with psychogenic seizures. This is um, you can see Joel Ryder, Donna Andrews, Charlotte Ryder, and Kurt LaFrance developed this. They actually developed it a couple decades ago for patients with epileptic seizures first, um, and then modified it for patients with psychogenic seizures. And so as you can see, there's a workbook here and a therapist guide. Um, and what I'll do when I work with someone with psychogenic seizures, if this is an appropriate sort of framework for them, is I'll have them get the workbook, purchase the workbook, and then I guide them through the treatment, um, which is about a 13 session long treatment. So we do weekly sessions, about 45 minutes. Each session has kind of a theme. Um, it is very cognitive behavioral in the sense that the patients do a lot of work on their own uh, between sessions. Um, some of the most useful interventions in this, included in this workbook and that I find sort of generally in working with patients with functional neurological disorders um, is teaching them relaxation practices things like progressive muscle relaxation can be particularly helpful. We know that's empirically supported for chronic pain as well, which a lot of these folks have. Um, and then cognitive restructuring um, is, is incredibly beneficial um, with this population. 
um, teaching patients about healthy communication, how to implement that in their day-to-day -day, um, lives, um, self-care. So there's sort of you know different dimensions and aspects of the treatment, and some become more relevant for, for certain patients than others. Um, but definitely the, the relaxation, particularly progressive muscle relaxation and cognitive restructuring are two that seem to be particularly useful for folks. Um, so then last thing here, um, just in terms of the development, um, this is an article that was recently published um, in Neurology, um, basically saying that, you know, we are in desperate need for a model of care for functional neurological disorders. This was just published this month in Neurology, and this is sort of what the authors recommended that that model of care kind of look like. Um, so self-management support, community resources, healthcare organization, um, delivery system redesign. So this is kind of a transition to a team-based care. So again, this is what I'm talking about with this multidisciplinary um, team um, and you know, patient-specific community providers to, to manage the care, to diagnose, to treat. Um, decision treatment plan and support. So use of these evidence-based guidelines and standards of care, um, somebody who's coordinating the care to make sure that the patient is receiving the proper interventions. Um, and then they say computer information system. So, you know, reminders to comply with care, um, use of technology. So this is getting at some of the sort of nuances. But um, what's important here is that, you know, there's there's been a, a huge amount of attention drawn to these um, you know, particularly in neurology recently, and that folks are really thinking about, you know, what can we make this look like? How can we, how can this work? Um, this is sort of the multidisciplinary team that they suggested. So um, here's, you know, where a neuropsychologist comes in, the patient or team leader would be the, the provider that has most contact with the patient. Here's the, um, you know, PTs and OTs, referring clinician, clinicians, if it's different than over here, the primary care doctor, Having family and other support people be involved um, is all proposed as being important. And I agree with this. I think this is a great model. Um, here are, just so everyone has them, two great resources. So th these are resources for patients um, generally who've been diagnosed with functional neurological disorders is the FND HOPE group. Um, and then the um, Non-epileptic-seizures.com is specifically for PNES. So these are these are patient resources, um, and this can patients can go here to try to find a provider. It's very hard for patients to find, find providers who specialize um, in the particularly the treatment um, of functional neurological disorders and psychogenic seizures. But both of these websites have lists of of providers, um, and and patients can go there and try to find a provider. Importantly, with telemedicine. Um, we're now able to see patients out of state, many of us, so that kind of broadens our horizon in terms of patients that we can help, which is great, um, but there still definitely is a dearth of, of providers for patients with functional neurological disorders. Um, and then the other um, resource that I would recommend for, for you know, students and for professionals is the Functional Neurological Disorder Society, which is great. We have a weekly webinar um, that uh, members can then view later on if you, you know if you can't make the the weekly session, um, and those are absolutely fabulous and really educational. Um, last thing, I would just like to acknowledge and thank everyone um, at Johns Hopkins um, in our departments of psychiatry and neurology, um, and then my colleagues more generally in the functional neurological disorder world um, and neurologists in the region who are particularly uh, interested in and supportive of the development of this program um, at Hopkins. Um, and probably most importantly, my patients and their families. So with that, I will conclude um, and open up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Buckholz. That was a really wonderful overview for everyone. Um, we do have several questions in the chat. So let me pull up um, a couple of them. First, we'll start with a um, Quick overview, uh, this person asked, can you just clarify the term psychogenic versus neurogenic again for our audience? Yeah, so, so the way that I use those terms is neurogenic, I'm referring to something with a known neurological cause. Um, so that would be something like Parkinson's disease or something like epilepsy. Um, obviously to my point at the outset of my talk, that's becoming a little bit more complicated now because we're realizing that there probably are 
neurological differences, but they're more functional neurological differences than they are structural neurological differences um, that we might see in, like I said, it's something like Parkinson's disease. But that's sort of how, I, how I'm using those terms. Psychogenic, I'm using synonymously with, with functional, even though, like I said, we don't necessarily, we know now that, that not all people who have functional neurological disorders have a, a, a frank psychological um, precursor to them, but I, I do use those terms still kind of synonymously. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, can you talk about any ethnic or cultural factors that might contribute to a diagnosis of functional neurological disorder or PNES? Um, this person is wondering if there might be certain ethnic groups that tend to express symptoms through somatization. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, there really is a, a, there's a dearth of literature on that and our understanding of that, but I think that's certainly something that I take into consideration when I'm doing my evaluations is how someone's cultural or religious beliefs could affect, um, you know, their symptoms and their expression. And, um, you know, for example, patients who have dissociative symptoms, sometimes it might be more common for patients to have dissociative um, like experiences um, because of their religion or their culture. And that might not be something that's pathological in nature. It might be something that's um, normal um, and sort of adaptive in, in their culture. And so when someone presents with symptoms like that, you know, some things that are dissociative or, you know, seem like they're sort of borderline, you know, delusional or, halluc or hallucinations or something like that, um, I, I make sure to kind of dig deep into that and understand that within the context of the person. Um, and again, that's sort of that patient-centered approach that I'm talking about is not just hearing about a symptom and making assumptions, but um, really thinking about that in terms of the patient. Um, but in terms of the, the, the differences um, in different cultural um, and racial and ethnic groups and the experience of functional neurological disorders, I think that's something that we really know um, very little about and need to learn a lot more about because I think um, it, it can greatly help it improve treatment, um, particularly for people who don't have as much experience um, and don't necessarily take that patient-centered approach. I think it's going to be really important that we know how to, how to best do that. Right. I think that's a really good point. Um, we have time for one brief last question. Uh, and this person asks that um, perhaps this population might be resistant to traditional CBT models. Are there any frequent modifications that you've used or found to be effective strategies for intervention in this population? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the first and foremost with, with my intervention is always um, getting the patient sort of on board and making sure that they understand the diagnosis, um, making sure that they're accepting of the diagnosis, that they have developed insight, that their questions are answered. Um, that's probably the main thing. I think, you know, it's much easier to implement CBT with somebody with depression or anxiety um, because that, those diagnoses are oftentimes more easily received and explained. And so I definitely spend more time in sort of that initial phase of educating the patient and working with them to accept their diagnosis um, than I do than I have with, with other patients in the past. You'll find that that's sort of a key, um, a really, really key piece. I mean, if, that, if you can't do that, then you can't really move forward from there. That makes sense, certainly. Um, well, that's it for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Buckholz. We really appreciate you being here and we'll see everyone next week. Thank you all. Thank you very much for having me.